Hi, this is Brian Mormers recording a lecture on non-inflammatory intestinal disease for medical surgical nursing for the University of Sioux Falls. All right, some of the learning objectives and topics that we'll talk about are IBS, herniation, um, colorectal cancer, obstruction, polyps, and hemorrhoids. We'll talk about colostomies a little bit, and then we'll talk about some abdominal trauma. So IBS is difficult because often we don't know what is causing this, um, and it's really hard to make a good solid diagnosis on it. Um, it's kind of ruling out other things that, um, that are, are more dangerous or more things that we can rule out. So what we often see is, you know, periods of uh, bowel spasm and dilatation with this one. We can use different Manning criteria and Rome 4 criteria. Manning's probably a little older. It's a little bit less sensitive, but a little bit more specific. Uh, the Rome is probably more commonly used. And so some of these criteria are like, you know, did you have irritable bowels? Did you, you know, did you have some cramping that was relieved by um, going to the bathroom, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are just some questions you can try to, you know, make this diagnosis. Etiology, though, why this is happening, we're not quite sure. So it can present in a couple of different uh, modalities. It could either be diarrhea, constipation, a mix, or, or it alternates. So treatment-wise, what we often will do is, you know, increase fiber and make sure that they're getting 30 to 40 grams daily, push fluids, have regular meals, avoid foods that exacerbate any signs and symptoms. Oftentimes this is like spicy food or different things like that. And then we can, you know, treat with therapy as uh, according to the signs and symptoms. So if they've got diarrhea, then we'll use things to, to stop that. If they've got constipation, then we'll try and loosen them up. Um, so all those different types of situations based on this. Now, if they do have a lot of pain with this, um, we can give an, like a tricyclic antidepressant, and oftentimes that can help um, relieve some of the discomfort with it. Other complementary therapies with this, um, you know, decreasing the stress in life can help with this, but I know that that's easier said than done. Um, other things like ginger, peppermint oil, and acupuncture have been shown to help out sometimes. Herniation, so this is when you get part of the intestines through a opening in the musculature. Um, and you can kind of see it popping out here. So with this, um, key terms I want you to know about is reducible, irreducible, and strangulated. Um, or instead of irreducible, I've heard incarcerated. So reducible means that you push on it and it goes back in. Irreducible does means the opposite, or incarcerated means that it can't move. So if if I do something, I go to jail and I'm incarcerated in jail means I can't move freely. And so that's the same thing with this. And then strangulated. And so if it goes through this musculature, but then it gets really tight and pinched in here and you're not getting good blood flow and oxygenation to the tissue, then that tissue is going to die. And so strangulation is just like if somebody puts their arms around your throat and you're not getting good air movement and, and perfusion. Non-surgical management, it's called the truss, so you can wear like a, a binder on here and that can help keep that in sometimes. I haven't really seen that in real practice a lot, but it, it is out there. Uh, more commonly, we're doing surgery on this one. This can be a minimally invasive inguinal hernia repair or any other type of uh, herniation repair. And oftentimes they'll go home um, that same day from this. So, of course, we're watching for, you know, making sure that the incision site is good, um, trying to prevent swelling as appropriate, doing pain control, and giving some antibiotics as they're recovering. So, when they have hernia repair, we really want to try them, uh, try to get them to not increase their inner abdominal pressure. So, try to minimize coughing, lifting, straining, any of those kind of things that can increase their belly uh, pressure. Colorectal cancer, so it's cancer of the colon. Um, so, could be a couple of different spots. So, you get your ascending, transverse, descending, and then rectum. And what I think is always kind of staggering here is your rectum and your sigmoid colon are probably the most. I mean, you've got 55% for these, this small little area here. And the reason why I think that this is very predominant is that this is where most of the stool will sit the longest. Um, and so um, when it sits the longest, you're going to have whatever contact um, of that 
uh, substance in with the, the cells, and that's going to change those cells. And so some of the risk factors for this would be, you know, high alcohol, high fat, um, barbecued foods. Um, getting that nice char on the steak that I like so much um, is actually carcinogenic a little bit. So um, that can be a risk factor. So um, Other things, being older than 50, so there's genetic predisposition, so family history of this or personal history of, of cancer at all. Polyps. Um, IBD for longer than 10 years, genetic testing, all those things can be risk factors. So what do we do with it? So, or how do we know about it first? So oftentimes it goes unseen. So this is oftentimes why we're doing colorectal screenings uh, as well as um, scoping every five to 10 years, especially based on age. You might see some rectal bleeding, some anemia over time. Um, you might have an abdominal distension or mass that's palpable. But most of the time these get caught on your screenings. And diagnosis wise, so good in H&P will give you a lot. Radiology of this and then doing scoping. Uh, colostomy, colostomies um, will sometimes follow this. So if we remove part of the intestines and oftentimes we bring it out here and put the bag on that you're aware of. Um, so after resection. Depending on where it's at is, you know, where we're going to have the colostomy at. Do we need it high, low, medium, right-sided, left-sided, those kind of situations. Where these are positioned will kind of give you the idea of where this, what the output of it's going to be like. If it's way down here in the rectum or in the sigmoid, this is going to be more fully developed stool because this is going to have a chance to take out some of the fluids. Um, if you are doing it right here, you're, you've only had this much intestine to try and take out fluids and it's still going to be pretty watery. So, so realize the closer you are um, to the end, the more firm the stool will be. Um, let's see here. Might do chemo, might do radiation on this, but I've seen um, surgery, uh, surgery is probably the gold standard. So colostomy care, we kind of talked about that before, but make sure that it, you've got a good stoma, it's pink, moist, um, it's got, uh, it's healing well, it's all intact, nothing's falling apart, nothing's going back into the patient's body. Because um, what, what's uncommon would be ischemia, necrosis, changing dusky colors, different stuff like that, breakdown of the suture line, bleeding, you know, all that stuff should not happen. You do want to measure the stoma, that way you can see how big it is, as well as when you're doing your cuts and stuff like that for your appliance, that it fits right. Make sure you're protecting the skin. Um, you want your appliance as close to that as possible, and then using skin barriers to try and protect the skin. Um, dietary measures control gas and odors, as well as we can put some powders and different things in there as well. But ultimate goal of this is to resume uh, a normal activity. as as soon as possible. So obstructions, there's lots of different ways we can get obstructions in the bowels. So they can have interception where it telescopes back in. We can have a volvulus where it's twisting, or we can have malrotation, um, like you're seeing here, in which you get twisting of the in intestines. Um, and so these are all mechanical ways of obstruction. They're non-mechanical ways. Um, Sometimes it's what they, it's a lack of peristalsis due to meds or treatments or surgery or different stuff like that. Sometimes it is related to some of the medications that they're taking. Sometimes they've swallowed things that maybe they shouldn't swallow. Um, so there's lots of different ways that people get obstructions of their bowel. Manifestations often uh, painful. They'll have some bilious vomiting. So if you, the bile gets dumped into the intestines, and so if you are seeing that you're having bile up, it means that there's an outflow pro problem. And so it's backing up and actually going into the stomach. Um, obstipation means no stool is going through. Diarrhea could just mean that there's some stool going through, but it's just the liquid stuff because everything else is all backed up. So the only thing that could free flow through there would be liquids. Um, listen to those stomach sounds, seeing if it's hyperactive or hypoactive. Diagnosis, assessments, and imaging, and radiology, and all those kind of fun things. Treatment-wise, surgical correction of these. 
Uh, with the interception, you might do a barium enema, and that can undo this. So by putting the pressure in here of the enema solution, or the, uh, the, the material that they put in there for imaging, it's a water contrast enema uh, is the appropriate term, not barium anymore. Um, but that can create enough pressure where that's going to pop that out and, and fix that. Um, but most of these other ones, it's surgical interventions. Polyps. So sessile ones are, are kind of flat on the inside of the intestines. Pedunculated are the ones that kind of hang down. Um, but these are gross in the mucosa, and they can cause some problems too because they can cause um, obstruction points and, and issues like that. Uh, most of these are benign in, in nature, but they can become malignant cells, and so, of course, then that turns into uh, colorectal cancer, and that's more uh, concerning. Uh, there tends to be a family history of this, um, but once again, the, the tough thing is, is that usually it's asymptomatic, and people don't know that they've got these. And as long as it's not causing any complications, that's fine. Although what you might see is obstructions and, and might be a leading point for intussusception. Hemorrhoids, these are swollen or distended veins, either within the body or outside of the body. So um, most are asymptomatic, but some have bleeding, itching, irritation, and pain. And so diagnostic. Diagnosis-wise, you can maybe see them, especially if they're external. Um, otherwise, doing a digital check or doing colonoscopies on this. So treatment-wise, so you can try and put on some different ointments. Um, otherwise, changing diets. Surgical management of this is going to be either like putting rubber bands around it and banding it to cut off the circulation so it just dies. Or you can take them back to surgery and do some cuts. Trauma, so the bad thing about your abdominal area is you've got many vascular organs there, and so, you know, any sort of trauma into your abdominal area is, is difficult and problematic. Now, blood trauma versus penetra penetrating trauma can be different, but both can cause lots of diff difficulties with this, um, and it can cause lots of bleeding, and so... You do want to make sure you're doing your ABCs, so airway, breathing, circulation. When it comes to circulation, we're worried about sock, shock from hemorrhage. You might see some hemorrhage signs and symptoms, like Cullen sign, which is bruising around the belly button. You can see Gray's Turner sign or Turner sign, which is ecchymosis on either flank by the kidneys. You can see Balance's sign, and that's left flank dullness, because what's going on is that you've ruptured the spleen, and then that's dull, and you can kind of hear that change in percussion. You might see Kerr's sign, which is left shoulder pain. Um, it's splenic laceration pain is what it is, but it radiates up into that left upper shoulder area. So treatment of trauma is very similar to GI bleeds. You know, you want two large uh, bore IV access if possible um, or more. And then you're going to probably type and cross match four units of blood and have that ready in case. Um, and then you're going to be giving saline, crystalloids, and possibly blood products as needed. Diagnostic-wise, so um, CTs and MRIs are probably some of your biggest things. This ultrasound, so using a fast so focus assessment with sonography and trauma is a big thing. Um, and they've even got like eFast, which is an extended version of that. Um, but you're taking the ultrasound probes and looking for any bleeding. Lab-wise, you might see changes with ABGs, CBGs, glucose, amylase, BUN, LFTs. And coags. Treatment wise, we're going to be pushing lots of fluid and electrolytes, possibly blood, um, and trying to stay ahead of them hemodynamically, and then surgical management if it's necessary. All right, that concludes this lecture. If you have any questions, please contact me.